Welcome back to this study of the apocalypse and to the final lecture in the series. As we reach this point in the course, it's remarkable to think about how far we've come. We've explored patterns of thought from the Hebrew prophets and ancient apocalyptic writers into the book of Revelation itself. We've also considered the incredible impact the apocalypse has had on people over the centuries since it was written. Along the way, we've met a colorful cast of characters, from theologians like Irenaeus and Augustine to medieval mystics like Joachim of Fiore. There have been reformers like Luther, musicians like Handel, and those who thought that the end had arrived, like William Miller. My concern, of course, is that you may look at all the variety and simply think that it shows that making sense of the book of Revelation is really a hopeless task. You might think that with all the options, the prudent approach would be to forget the whole thing and not even try. But my purpose in showing you the range of possibilities from ancient times until now has been to underscore the importance of interpreting Revelation constructively. By now it should be clear that this book has an incredible ability to capture people's imaginations. Its vivid language and imagery are too alluring to be left alone. And in some cases, this has led to ideas about the future that are speculative at best and harmful at worst. So my goal is to pursue an alternative course and to let Revelation open up ways of seeing that challenge people in creative ways that ultimately benefit us all. Throughout the latter part of the course, I've often noted that much of what people see in Revelation depends on the assumptions they make and the questions they ask. We've seen that when people assume that Revelation predicts the future, they have tried to turn the book into an outline of coming events. Often they create futuristic scenarios by combining passages from various parts of the Bible, like pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. And the result is usually a scenario that looks rather different from what the passages said when read in their own contexts. We've also seen that this approach all too often gives the impression that Revelation is a book to be feared. And in some contexts, it fuels debates about how current events might fulfill passages from the Bible. But the scholarship that I found most valuable assumes that Revelation was a book that was written to challenge and encourage readers from the moment it was written. It was not a book of secrets that only now has become intelligible to us in the 21st century. Rather, the book's message was designed to be meaningful to people who first read it. And as we discover ways in which our situations have something in common with theirs, we'll find the book continuing to speak meaningfully today. In the first lecture, I said that the Greek word apokalypsis, or apocalypse, refers to a disclosure to something that offers a way of seeing. My point was that the visions were not designed to conceal meaning. They were designed to reveal it, to help people see things in ways they would not have seen otherwise. On the challenging side, the bizarre images of a dragon, beast, and harlot helped to startle people into seeing the destructive character of the forces at work in the world, and then to call people to resist them. At the same time, the book gives people visions of hope that call them beyond the forces that bring despair so that they can have a more vital sense of God's commitment to make all things new. This is not a perspective that negates the world. It's a perspective that engages the world in a fashion that is both critical and constructive. There have been many scholars who have developed some very promising ways of reading Revelation and other apocalyptic texts. And what I want to do is to tell you more about what a few of them have done and why. Let's start with a little historical background. You remember that several lectures ago, I noted that in the 19th century, people were starting to give greater attention to Revelation's historical context. And many welcomed the idea because for a long time, the apocalyptic rhetoric had been overheating. People had been looking for the millennium that never came, and many concluded that it would be more realistic to look for a little gradual progress, rather than expecting some grand millennial age to arrive. 
As part of this process, scholars tended to focus on the writings of the Hebrew prophets, which they valued because of their strong ethical commitments, and they put the apocalyptic writings off to the side as texts that seem to be speculative and otherworldly. To some extent, this was also a reaction against the kind of futuristic interpretation that was developing. People were aware that some were appealing to Revelation as proof that the world was soon going to spin off into chaos just before Jesus came back. So the people who didn't share that perspective tended to say, okay, if people really want to think that Revelation is all about the end of the world, fine. We don't need it. We'll focus on the parts of the Bible that are more constructive. But that movement away from apocalyptic texts has changed in recent years. There's been a kind of renaissance of interest in apocalyptic writings. And this modern renaissance has opened up perspectives that I've found to be very rewarding. A major point in this renewal of interest was signaled in 1960. That was when a German New Testament scholar named Ernst Käsemann declared that apocalyptic was the mother of all Christian theology. He made that comment in an essay that pointed to the early church's conviction that the death and resurrection of Jesus disclosed God's commitment to set things right in the world. It was a perspective in which hope for the future intruded into the present. It was a hope that recognized that the powers of the past were still at work, but that God also was at work, bringing his righteous reign into all of life and calling people to share his just and life-giving purposes in the here and now. Kazeman's emphasis on the apocalyptic dimension of this was startling. He was an academic and held a prominent position at a German university. At that time, the apocalyptic themes in the Christian tradition were thought to be strange holdovers from earlier forms of Jewish thought. They seemed to reflect outmoded ideas that people needed to move beyond in order to find something relevant for the modern world. So when Kesemann gave a central place to apocalyptic thinking, it seemed like he'd turned everything upside down. And in a sense, that's what he was doing. And his reasons for doing so came not only from his academic research, but from his life experience. For Kazeman, the question at the heart of apocalypticism was not when the world would end. His question was, to whom does the world belong? It was a question of lordship. And Kazeman focused on the question of lordship because he understood that the world was a place in which there were powers that competed for people's loyalties. His perspective was shaped by the conflicts that emerged in the church in Germany in the years before and during the Second World War. The role of Nazism as an ideology, along with Hitler's rise to power, had created a situation of competing truth claims. On one side were the claims of the state. Nazism operated with a racist ideology in which people of Aryan descent were declared to be inherently superior to all others. This, of course, fueled Hitler's military campaign to extend Nazi rule over Europe. And the ideology also led to his attempts to marginalize and exterminate those who were thought to be racially inferior, such as the Jews. The Nazis developed a kind of cult around Hitler's leadership. People in the military and the civil service no longer swore allegiance to the state or its constitution. They were to swear personal allegiance to Hitler as the leader. On the other side of the conflict was the confessing church. That group resisted the attempts of the Nazis to impose their ideology on the Protestants in Germany. The Confessing Church is most often identified with people like Karl Barth and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and Kesemann was connected to it too. A pivotal moment came when Christians were asked to adopt a statement that made it essential for leaders in the church to be of Aryan descent. That statement would have made racist ideology, rather than a commitment to the Christian faith, the defining mark of the church. 
So those in the confessing church had to resist by affirming that their supreme loyalty belonged to Christ and that this higher loyalty was what would shape their course of action. In the years before the war, Kaseman served as a parish pastor, and at one point he was imprisoned by the Nazis for a while. Then when the war broke out, it showed the devastating consequences of the Nazi ideology. It brought home all too clearly that fundamental commitments did matter. Kaseman once recalled that the Nazis had said, Heaven is for sparrows and Christians, but earth is for us. But their claim to rule the earth played out in the concentration camps in the ruined cities of Europe. And for Kaseman, this was the opposite of the lordship of God and his Messiah. He understood that God's purposes were ultimately redemptive, not destructive. And this is where the apocalyptic tradition was so important. Kaseman had been disturbed by people who seemed to privatize their faith as if it had nothing to do with the rest of life. But for Kaseman, the apocalyptic tradition didn't allow people to compartmentalize things in this way, as if heaven mattered and earth did not. Much of his work focused on the apocalyptic dimension of Paul's letters, which linked the hope for resurrection of individuals to hope for the redemption of the whole creation. But when Kaseman did write about Revelation, he repeated his question, To whom does the world belong? The idea is that basic commitments do matter. The war may have focused that question in a particularly urgent way, but in every generation, people base their lives on the beliefs and values they hold most deeply. These shape the way they see the present and the future. There are various forces at work competing for these loyalties. What Revelation does is to press people to keep the horizon broad enough to include God's determination to make all things new. Those who have studied Revelation from a historical perspective can see it working with that question, to whom does the world belong? Revelation was composed by a writer who saw a clash between the claims of the empire and the claims of his faith. He didn't work with a privatized spirituality. His description of the beast portrayed a ruling power that claimed authority over every tribe and people and nation. And the beast's authority was exercised through conquest and oppression. In an earlier lecture, I noted that in Asia Minor, the imperial temple at Aphrodisias pictured first century emperors standing in triumph over the captive nations that were helpless at their feet. That was the character of lordship that was celebrated there. So Revelation seeks to disclose the character of the forces at work in the world by portraying this as a clash between the beast and the lamb. The beast wins victory by subjugating others. The lamb wins victory through the power of his self-sacrifice, which liberates and frees. Where the beast seeks dominion by wielding the power of death, the Lamb's victory leads through death toward the ultimate gift of life. This way of reading Revelation doesn't treat the vision of the beast as a prediction of a distant figure known as the Antichrist. Rather, it recognizes that the imagery was designed to startle readers into seeing the destructive side of the dominant political ideology. At the same time, the imagery called people to renew their commitments to the ways of the Creator and the Lamb. To be clear, the book points to a future that is ultimately beyond the capacity of any human being to create. In its final vision, death itself is overcome. Sorrow and grief are banished. And it is God who makes all things new. In this ultimate sense, Revelation assumes that the future can only be a gift of God. Yet keeping that vision in mind can also shape the perspectives on the present. It can shape perspectives on the present by calling people to resist the many forces that diminish life, while encouraging a sense of hope and renewed commitment to the world God has made and will make new. This interplay between challenging people in the present while calling them to hope 
for the future has encouraged some scholars to revisit the question of Revelation's link to the prophetic tradition, and I found this helpful. You recall that for many years there had been a tendency to separate the apocalyptic writings from the prophetic writings. The idea was that the prophets focused on ethical issues and urged people to engage with the present world. But the apocalyptic writings were seen as speculative and otherworldly. Where the prophets were thought to envision hope arising out of the present and opening up the future, the apocalyptic texts saw the present world ending with a cataclysm that would be followed by a new age. Those who worked with these distinctions eventually saw that things were much clearer in theory than they were in practice. As scholars gave renewed attention to apocalyptic literature, they began to see that these texts really fell along a spectrum. And the same was true of the prophetic writings. Rather than putting them in two completely separate categories, it seemed better to see them on a sliding scale. The prophetic writings certainly included hope for a more just society on earth. But the prophets also pressed the limits of ordinary life when they envisioned the nations of the world beating their swords into plowshares and coming to Jerusalem to learn God's ways. They went even further when they envisioned an end to death itself and the onset of a new heaven and a new earth. When the prophetic texts expanded the horizon of hope to that point, they were not far from what the apocalyptic writers were saying. The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls right after World War II added to the mix. The scrolls helped scholars see that ancient Judaism was much more diverse than had been previously thought. The scrolls included both apocalyptic and non-apocalyptic elements. Something like the War Scroll, which I mentioned in an earlier lecture in this course, expected present conflict between the forces of light and darkness to end with a great battle in the future. That certainly seemed like an apocalyptic theme. Yet the War Scroll wasn't written in the classic apocalyptic genre. It was not a visionary narrative like Daniel or First Enoch. And then there were Dead Sea texts about a new temple and a new Jerusalem, and scholars couldn't always tell whether these texts offered hope for things in this world or whether they pointed to an apocalyptic age to come. The complexity continued as scholars turned to the world of early Christianity. Everyone knew that Revelation was an apocalypse. After all, it essentially defined the apocalyptic genre. Yet the opening lines of Revelation also claimed that it was a book of prophecy. And the writer seemed to think of himself as a prophet. So if the author thought of his own book as a prophetic text, then one had to ask if modern scholars could say that it was not prophetic, because that would mess up their categories. It seemed like the connections might actually have been stronger than scholars had been willing to admit. As people looked at John's own sense of his vocation, the prophetic dimension also became more prominent. It was clear that his book drew heavily on the language and imagery of the Hebrew prophets. Whether speaking of God's heavenly throne room or the New Jerusalem, he developed lines of thinking that were shared by Isaiah, Ezekiel, and other prophetic writers. At the same time, John was not merely interpreting the older texts. He spoke with a directness that brought a pointed word of confrontation and hope to the people of his time. And as John did this, he was certainly not alone. The book of Acts and the letters of Paul also note the presence of prophets in early Christian communities. So, John apparently had a similar role. Seeing Revelation as part of this broader prophetic tradition has encouraged people to see the dynamic way that its visions pertain both to the present and the future. One example that we noted earlier in this course was the vision of Babylon. You remember that John portrayed imperial Rome as a harlot who had an endless appetite for all the goods the world could produce. He listed things from gold, silver, jewels, and pearls to the slave trade, which reduced human life itself to a commodity. 
Much of John's language was actually inspired by passages from the classic Hebrew prophets. So when he warned that the destructive forces at work in his world will lead to society's own destruction, he stands in good company with his prophetic forebears. The way the apocalypse challenges and encourages people has taken on new dimensions through the globalization of biblical studies. Although people from around the world have long read the Bible, the academic study of it was traditionally centered in Europe and North America. But as voices from around the globe have joined in the discussion, there's been an added sense of the urgency around Revelation's message. Some of the voices in the discussion have come from Latin America, where many have had to struggle with issues of political oppression and poverty. And in the context of these problems, some have found that Revelation's imagery offers a way to name the powers of violence and oppression while giving people a reason to persevere, knowing that injustice will not have the final say. Perhaps I can tell a, share a story that brings together some of the trends that I've been describing here. It's the story of Elizabeth Kazeman, who was the daughter of Ernst Kazeman, the New Testament scholar I mentioned earlier. Elizabeth grew up in the university circles of Germany, where her father had become a notable professor. But her own interests really had to do with issues of poverty, so she ended up going to Argentina, where she worked among the poor in Buenos Aires. At that time, Argentina was ruled by a military dictatorship. And because of her work, she was seen as a threat to the regime. So one day she disappeared, as thousands of others had disappeared. What happened is that she was arrested by the security police who had her tortured and secretly executed. When her death became known, it was an all too vivid reminder about the forces of brutality that continued to operate in the world. It would be several decades before some of those responsible were brought to trial. It was stories like this, along with the stories of many others in Latin America, that helped to shape the way a scholar at Harvard Divinity School wrote about the apocalypse. The scholar's name was Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza, and she had a keen sense that the book's vision of God's work in the world extended to all facets of life. She could see how the book challenged the social and political forces that now diminished human life, and how it called for people to engage in the struggle against them. She called her book Revelation, Vision of a Just World, and she dedicated it to Elizabeth Kazeman and to many other Latin Americans who had lost their lives in a world where the forces of injustice were very much at work. In North America, the circle of discussion now includes African American voices who have added new dimensions to the interpretation of Revelation. You remember that in an earlier lecture, we explored ways in which the language and imagery of the book were taken up in African American music. We looked at ways in which Revelation opened up a sense of a future that gave people courage for life in the present. Some of those insights came from an African American scholar named Brian Blunt, as he considered the message of Revelation in its ancient context. He also looked at its role in African American culture. And bringing these things together, he identified a central theme in Revelation as witness. Blunt finds that bearing witness means telling the truth in situations where the truth is disputed. Those who bear witness show the integrity of conviction. They don't retreat from the world. They engage with the world in ways that can be transformative. The African-American tradition has helped us see that the apocalypse can be remarkably candid about the dispiriting side of life. Yet it also battles against the forces that bring despair by drawing people toward a future that's not defined by the present moment. That notion of witness means telling the truth about the world as it is, with all its flaws and shortcomings. Yet it also means bearing witness to a God who keeps opening up the future in order to bring something that's freeing. As I think about some of the many voices who have contributed to my own study of Revelation, I keep coming back to the interplay between the book's two main dimensions. 
It has an unparalleled ability to both challenge and encourage people. And both aspects work together to create its powerful effect. This book never does anything in pastel colors. It's written in the most intense shades imaginable. Where the author sees evil at work, his writing is punchy, hard-hitting, and confrontational. And when he speaks of hope, he gives us radiant scenes that are so vast that they beggar the imagination. And the key to understanding the book, I think, is to let it move you through the scenes that challenge you and into the visions that give you hope. Because hope is finally what this book is all about. You see, hope is built right into the structure of Revelation. The writer isn't content to hold back the promise until the very end. He keeps giving it to people again and again as he tells the story of God's victory over the forces that destroy life and drive people to despair. I've found that one of the most liberating insights into the character of the apocalypse is that its plot doesn't move in a straight line. Instead, each great cycle of visions moves through the scenes that challenge and disturb readers back into the presence of God and the Lamb. And the book does this over and over again. This insight about the internal repetition is an old one. You may recall that a form of it goes back to Victorinus in the third century. But that breathtakingly simple insight helps to offset the notion that Revelation is a clear-cut roadmap to the Battle of Armageddon. You remember that the book opens with the messages to the seven churches. All of those messages deal with things that are real issues for the readers. The challenges are genuine. Yet immediately after that, the book takes them into the presence of God, where the whole host of heaven sings praise to the God who created all things and to the Lamb who redeems the people of every tribe and nation. Then the book does it again. The seven seals are opened and the threats are unleashed. But then hope intrudes again. An angel calls a halt to the action and takes the readers back into the presence of God where a countless multitude is giving praise. When you read this book, it may seem like you're on a roller coaster. And in a sense, you are. The writer takes you on a wild ride that moves in a great spiraling motion in which you go hurtling down into scenes full of monsters and plagues that will set your hair on end. But then you go flying upward along the tracks until you see the incredible views of light at the top. Around and around you go, sometimes looking at the world upside down. But all the while, you're headed towards that vision of the New Jerusalem where the tree of life is found. I tell people that if you're reading Revelation and want to despair, then you've stopped reading too soon. You need to turn one more page and look to the next chapter because there will be a message of hope there waiting for you. I also remind people that if the promise seems lost, then we need to let the musicians help us out. Because every time we move through scenes of threat into promise, Revelation gives us a song. And for centuries, the musicians have been setting these words to music so that people can continue adding their voices to the resounding message of hope. When you think of the apocalypse, think of the Hallelujah Chorus or the saints that go marching in to a Dixieland beat because that's the direction the book is pulling you as one of its readers. The songs can show us the way. Hope and life are the goal. I'm delighted that I've had a chance to travel with you through this book that has captured my imagination and the imagination of so many others. The challenge in teaching a course like this is deciding what to include and what to leave out because there's always so much more to see.
So if I've been able to give you a sense of the possibilities and to invite you to join in the ongoing conversation, then our work here has been a success. Many thanks for taking this journey with me.